Welcome to Consulting Mastery, where we help B2B consultants master the business of consulting. I'm Carrie. And I'm Ahmed. Join us as we explore the art of delivering outstanding client value, earning a higher income, and thriving in today's marketplace. Today on Consulting Mastery, we're going to talk about what is preventing you from hitting those elusive revenue goals that you have for your business. And spoiler alert, it's probably not what you think it is. Now, if you want our help hitting those revenue goals, we may be able to help you head over to 90daypipeline.com forward slash talk and let's find out. I'm springing this topic on Carrie spur of the moment. She has no idea what I'm about to ask her on purpose. I want to hear like the actual raw, you know, response, not the, the scripted rehearsed thought, thought through response. And here's the question for consulting firms under a million dollars who presumably want to grow beyond a million dollars and want to scale. What are they doing wrong? <laughs> What's preventing wow. them from getting, getting to, yeah, it's not about a million dollars, but I'm just using that for context of a small consulting firm, not a big firm, small firm wants to grow. What's like the one thing they're getting wrong. So you're going to ask me the biggest question. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. It's interesting because what first came to mind when you said that is I don't know that it's about what they are doing wrong. It might be more about what they're thinking wrong. That is terrible grammar. <laughs> but um, there are probably several things not being done, like actions not being taken or being taken at a sub in a suboptimal way. But I think when you dig it all comes down more to what's going on inside somebody's head and what that allows them to take on what, you know, what that allows them to envision, what that allows them to, you know, kind of work through when things aren't going so well. So, I mean, if I extrapolate that a little bit further, I would say that what they're doing wrong is not paying attention to the way they think and not, taking action to optimize the way that um, they approach their, their business and probably their life in general, if we're going to get really broad about it. So now everyone knows that you spring the question because that was a bit of a word salad, but that's what I think. Yeah. It makes sense though, right? Like, I mean, this is the whole premise of Napoleon Hill's think and grow rich is that you have to be able to conceive of the future state in order to achieve the future state or put another way. You've got to, believe it if you want to see it. Uh, there's an interesting exercise that one of our team members was walking me through that she read in a, in a, in a good book. Um, and, and the exercise is about identifying the things that are drawing on your energy. Mm. Like what's really like gnawing at your energy and occupying mental head space and just draining you and distracting you from the things that you should be doing. And so in this exercise, you know, they have you, make a list of all the things that are just stressing you out, worrying you, et cetera. And then they have you rank them um, according to, you know, what's urgent, what's important, whatnot. And then the stuff that's left over that's urgent and important, you can either fix it, like solve the problem, materially, physically solve the problem, or you can get yourself to a place where you can visualize the problem being solved. Or you have to abandon it and there's no fourth option. You either fix it, you see it getting fixed or you abandon it altogether. And I just think it's, it's a brilliant exercise because if you can't, if you can fix it, fix it, obviously, right? If there's things that you can, that are, that are weighing on your mind right now that you can fix physically, materially solve for do it because that's a, that's a drag, right? That's like an anchor that's holding you back. And if you can eliminate drag or, or like release an anchor, then you're going to move faster. So fix it. Well, but you can't fix everything right away. Mm -hmm. It's not practical, right? So what if I can't fix it right away? Well, then the question becomes, can you see it getting fixed? Can you see the situation being resolved? Can you see the problem being solved? Can you see the future state, the outcome, the result being achieved? Because if you can see it, 
Well, right away, there's a level of calm that comes with that. There's a level of, you know, oh, okay, yeah, this is the path. I can see it happening. And you can then materially work towards achieving that. But if you can't see it, if you can't even visualize it, if you can't even, you know, conceptually in your mind, in your imagination, chart a path to getting to the end state, then that is a waste of energy that is uh, doing you no good and you ought to abandon it. And the reason I bring up this exercise is I think, you know, your notion of they're not thinking through, well, lots of things, but they're not thinking through what they want. And they're not conceiving of the future state in their mind before they seek to make it a reality. And what ends up happening is I think a lot of folks are just focused on, you know, like nebulous things like growth and scale (laughs) and more, you know, they just, well, just want to grow. Well, to what end? How will you know you've grown? (laughs) Define growth. How much growth? How many clients? How much revenue? Like we have these conversations with people and we're like, what do you, what do you want to achieve this year? What's your goal? They usually spit out a number. Okay. Well, what's it going to take to get there? How many clients? What's your average revenue per client? What service are you going to focus on? How are you going to get like that? These details need to be necessarily defined at the very least in your mind. If you want to have any hope of actually materially achieving the end goal. So many thoughts. Um, I want to go back to the exercise because I think the third option, the let it go, I think is really, really interesting because you might think that the first two are the challenging ones, but they're not right. I mean, of course they are solving the problem, even visualizing that the problem can be solved that, you know, you can probably wrap your mind around that, but we love to hold on to the things that we f- we either overtly feel or sort of niggle in the back of our minds, we feel are going to hold us back because those are the built-in excuses, right? Those are the, oh, well, I guess this is why it didn't work out. You know, I always knew that would be the case. Those are the things that allow us to maintain some dignity, <laughs> at least feel like we're maintaining some dignity if things don't go the way that we want, Right. Well, I always knew that was going to be a problem. I always knew that was going to stand in my way. I always knew that might be the thing that stopped me. And what's really interesting about that is that self-protective instinct to hold on to the thing now becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Now, now it becomes the thing that you let hold space in your mind, right? That you let get in your way because, you know, whether you've, purposely done it. And and most often it's not the case, right? You're, you're holding that in your back pocket and therefore it's something that always exists, right? It always exists in your thoughts. It always exists, even to your point, like in the, in the notion of a visioning, visioning exercise. If you go through that and you decide what you want your revenue to be, and you decide what you want your life to work, to look like, and you decide, you know, what you want your work day to look like and who you want to be working with and the problems you want to solve, but you're still holding on to that anchor, that thing in the background, um, you're absolutely not doing yourself any favors. And it really takes some effort to reverse that thing that is is normal human behavior, right? Normal human behavior is to to hedge, <laughs> to to have the this this built-in explanation that helps you when you are afraid, right? Looking at this, this big dream that you want to have. Why do we hedge? It's a good question. I'm not a psychologist, but I feel like there's something there around. um, Well, I mean, I said it a little bit earlier, like maintaining dignity, right? Like there's something about not wanting to be proven Mm -hmm. foolish or stupid, right? You want to be able to say, oh, I knew this could happen. And I mean, that's, it's fair in a lot of ways, right? Like there's, there's a reason that we do that. What we don't look like, what we don't look at 
rather is the dark side of that. Yeah. And what it can really do, like how insidious it can be to, to hold on to those things instead of, to your point, putting them on the damn list, right? In column number three and then saying, okay, I get it. I'm walking away from this. Yeah. It's ultimately a fear of failure, right? You hedge because if one thing doesn't work out, you've got something else to hold on to. So um, I've been re-listening to a book I've I've listened to before audiobook. Um, it's a it's, a, it's a really short little book. It's called, it's all in your head uh, by a guy named Russ. Russ, I gather is some kind of very famous hip hop artist and producer, which I didn't know until I listened to the book. Right. Um, but really, really good book. Uh, and I really appreciate his perspective. He told this story about uh, when he was in high school and he was talking to his music teacher and I think his, he wanted to go into hip hop and become a become a uh, you know an artist, and his parents wanted him to go to law school. So he's asking his music teacher, you know, like should I diverse? Like I'm I'm in, I'm, I'm trying to go for this hip hop thing, but like you know should I also like maybe like go to law school and like you know so I don't want to have all my eggs in one basket, so I have uh, options. And his music teacher said to him, "Just make sure you have a basket." Right. In other words, don't diversify yourself out of a goal. Don't diversify yourself out of a path. Don't diversify yourself out of some reasonable path to success, which is frankly what most people do. You know, and, and this is true for you know, young kids coming out of high school and in college, and this is true for entrepreneurs, and this is true for people that are in later stages in life. They they have things that they care about. They have goals, but they diversify themselves out of those goals. They come up with all these secondary things, either because they want to protect themselves from failure or because there's some societal or familial expectation that they need to do other things or whatever it may be, but they have all these secondary goals that are simply going to, to draw focus away from and energy from the primary goal. You know, another book I'm digging into again recently is Relentless by Tim Grover, who trained Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, Dwayne Wade, et cetera. And when you think about these athletes, you know, the, 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 all of them, frankly, all professional athletes, and certainly the ones at the top, they didn't get there by having five goals. They didn't get there by, you know, these folks didn't, didn't have a, uh, you know, a backup career plan. They didn't have a secondary option. They had one option and they made it work. Yeah. I don't know how I feel about that. We might, we may have a debate here because I, I agree with you, but the question is when does that occur? Right. Especially in sports, right? When do you decide that you're going to stop playing basketball and hockey and lacrosse and choose one and I think the timing of that and this may be off off topic a bit but the timing of that is also really critical because in order to make the commitment you need to be in a place where you are truly ready to make the commitment I think a lot of folks really struggle because sort of flip side to what you were saying there's a pressure to make a commitment right? I must do this, start this business in a certain way with a particular goal in mind. And they will, you know, outwardly make that commitment, <laughs> but not necessarily be on board because of all this baggage and stuff that we're talking about. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I, I agree and disagree. I think there's a point where you get there, but the, that, inflection happens at a very particular moment and you need to do the work to get yourself to the place where you can in fact jump in with both feet and you know stop with the mitigation strategies you know to the degree that you, that you may have them now well the conversation that we had this morning on one of our team meetings was about readiness you know we see two kinds of people come to us those who are ready and those who are not ready they all say they want to grow. <laughs> they all say they want more revenue. 
They all say they want a bigger business. They all say that they have these goals and some are ready and some are not ready. And I think the the point I'm trying to make here is don't kid yourself if you're not ready. Don't don't tell me you want to go from, you know, 100k to 500k if you're not actually ready. You know, one of our team members made the comment of uh, you know, I want Cindy Crawford's body but I'm not willing to put in the work required to actually have Cindy Crawford's body. Like I want it. I desire it. I'm not really ready for it. So many people want to grow their business. Many people want a larger firm. Many people want a team. Many people want more revenue. Many people want more cash flow, et cetera. But, and if you're listening to this, you may want those things. You may desire them. Are you actually ready to acquire them? Are you ready to commit Are you ready to go all in? Because my contention is, you know, having grown a business, having experienced ups and downs, having had to climb out of holes, it will take all of you if you're going to succeed. So, you know, again, three options, right? Either do it, see yourself doing it, or abandon it for now. Because if you tell yourself you want to do it and you... You, you proclaim desire, but you're not really fully committed to seeing it through. You're wasting your, your time and your energy and probably other people's as well. Yeah, I mean, it all comes down to, as most things do, how honest you can be with yourself. And, you know, you said earlier, we asked clients what their financial goal is. And one of the, you know, initial flags that someone's not ready and not being honest with yourself, how many people do we ask? And they're like, oh, I don't know. I don't want to say that out loud. And, you know, if you're listening, I'll ask you the question, you know, are you willing, excuse me, to to walk out into the world and say out loud what it is that you want? If you're not, there's work to be done. (laughs) So let's bring it home. How do we start this episode? You threw a question at me. Biggest mistake entrepreneurs are making. Could have, could have gone any number of ways there, but I like where we landed. If you want to grow your business, you know, first of all, you need to conceive of what that looks like, right? Growth is not a meaningful, specific enough goal. What does growth mean? Where do you want to get to? What number? Yes, the number matters. What's going to be required to hit that number? What do you need to do? Right? What's you know, what's, what are the, the necessary details around offer and pricing, et cetera, that will make that happen. All that needs to be figured out. And then you got to ask yourself really seriously, like, do I have what it takes? Am I committed? If I do nothing else in the next year or two, but achieve this goal and otherwise tread water in all the other areas of my life, Will I be satisfied with my progress? And the answer is no. My contention is you're not ready.